Tonight, I'm going to give an introduction to adult stoneflies. I'm going to start with a summary of the species found in Britain, some details of the extinct and endemic species. Uh, I'll then talk a little bit about the life cycle and ecology before giving an overview of their identification, and highlighting some of the species you may encounter. And finally, I'll explain how to collect and record adult stoneflies. Um, so stoneflies are a very ancient group of insects. They, there are fossils from the early Permian era into about 260 million years ago. Uh, and like most other groups of insects, they are mainly temp in, in distributed in temperate regions, They're mainly found in cool, fast flowing, well oxygenated upland streams. There's more than 3,500 species in the world, and 35 of those species are known from the UK. We've got two endemic species and two endemic subspecies, which I'll explain a little bit more about in a minute. This is the British checklist. Um, you can see it's dominated by the Nemuridae, uh, 12 species there, and the other species are split between six other families. Uh, the eagle-eyed, if you will notice, two, two species with uh, asterisks next to them, and those are two species that are thought to be extinct in the UK. And I'll just explain, I'll just show you some pictures of them just now and explain where they were found before. The first one is Xanthopella apicalis, which is known from three specimens in the Oxford Uni University Museum of Natural History. Um, there's no locality information on the labels for these specimens, it just says England, um, but they're typically found in larger lowland rivers. And it was described from, uh, uh, from England. Um, and uh, I think the, the record says it's from Hertford, uh, Herefordshire, sorry. Um, but there's been no records and, and despite looking, we've not found any specimens. But it's possible it's still there. And certainly in some of the larger lowland rivers, you might have a look and be particularly interested in any yellow mayflies you find. Quite striking antenna, this species as well. The other species is Isoperl obscura, which once was found in the River Trent near Nottingham. And there's quite a few records, quite a lot of specimens in museums around the country of this. It seems to have been uh, quite a, uh, a notable discovery when it was found. But despite recent search, this species has not been recorded, uh, re recorded. And considering the um, pollution that was in the Trent over the last 100 years, um, it's possible that this species has been genuinely lost from the UK. Two other species um, that are of note are Isogenus dubecula, which was found in the Welsh River Dee in 1959, but was thought to have been lost from there after a catastrophic decline in numbers. Um, for 25 years, there hadn't been any records despite intensive searches for the species. And then John Davy Bowker from the Freshwater Biological Association rediscovered it in 2017 um, near Bangor. And John had been going out to the river for 25 years looking for this species, just not giving up hope on this species. And finally, he was rewarded in 2017. So it just shows, goes to show that, you know, you, you shouldn't really write off a species um, without really, you know, with good evidence. The other species is Namura lacustris, which is, was added to the British list in 2012. Um, this was a species that um, would appear to have been here for quite a while. Uh, but it's very similar as a nymph um, to another species, Nemuris cinerea, and it had been overlooked. And uh, Mike Hammett uh, discovered this in, in 2011, 2012, and um, described, uh, added it to the checklist. Found in Winterbournes in the south of England, and it's a Winterbourne specialist, so it likes rivers that dry up. Um, and it is it's quite common across the south of England in those habitats. I mentioned the endemic species. This is the first of our endemic subspecies, uh, the February red, Teneopteryx nebulosa britannica. Uh, it differs from the uh, European subspecies uh, by the length of the wings in the, the male. The male's on the right there, and you can see the wings are a bit shorter than the body. It's also got very long legs um, in the British species. And the nymph differs slightly as well from other subspecies. Uh, this species has two main habitat types. It's it found in upland areas in fairly swift flowing 
uh, rivers, uh, in the in the margins of those, in the, the slack water, in the margins of those. And it's also found in lowland areas, in weedy um, bits of river as well, which is quite unusual. And there's a bit more work to be done looking at whether there's uh, perhaps a difference in the, the subspecies that are in each of those habitats. The other one is the widow stonefly, Capnia vidua anglica. Um, this is a species that's um, distributed, the, the species is distributed quite widely across Northern Europe, um, and there are five different subspecies. Um, there's a uh, subspecies on, on Iceland, in um, mainland Europe, in Scandinavia, in Scandinavia, and there's uh, this one, which is the species. And it's, it's fairly subtle, the differences, but it's all in the uh, male genitalia. The epicrop is. And then for our two endemic species, we have uh, the orange striped stonefly, Perlodes mortini, which I'll talk about more about later on um, and show you some of the, the features that distinguish that from, from other Perlodes species in Europe. Um, but it's quite a big, big insect out in March, uh, March and April. Um, and you can see it's got that orange stripe around the head and the um, pronotum. And the other species, the northern February red, Brachyptra patata. Uh, this species is only found now in Scottish rivers in the Cairngorms and, and north of there. Um, it was first described in the late 1800s, uh, yeah, late 1800s. And this is a female, it's got these barred wings and, and it differentiates it from the other Brachyptra species in the UK by, the, by that um, dark wing tip. The male is a reddish brown colour. Um, and as these shortened wings uh, that would, like we saw in the Taenioptric species. Interestingly, it was described um, new to science in the late 1800s, and it's perhaps one of the only insects in this country that has a, its tight locality on a banknote. This is the River Clyde at New Lanark, and that little bit of river, I don't know if you can see my pointer just here, is uh, where this species was first collected from and described by Kenneth Morton. Okay, so on, on life cycles, um, I'll just give you a little bit of information about the life cycles and uh, the various life stages. The, um, it starts off with mating. This is a, a mating pair of um, Protonomura stoneflies. Uh, the male is on the top and the female on the, on the bottom. And the, you see that they're sort of like slightly on uh, at this, the male slightly at the side. And that's because it needs to get its at the end of its abdomen round underneath the wings. So it looks a bit, it looks a bit uh, awkward, but um, that's what's happening there. They, um, they mate, uh, well, when they mate, they mate for um, anything between a couple of seconds up to maybe half an hour. They'll stay coupled together, maybe longer. Um, once they're mated, the, the female will tend to repel any other advances from other stoneflies, other males. Um, and they'll typically mate on vegetation or on, on twigs and things at the side of the, the river. The female will just take her eggs and, and produce her eggs. Um, she um, produces them into a, a, a little ball that she holds underneath her, her abdomen, underneath the tails and the species with tails. And she'll produce anything up to about two and a half thousand eggs, depending on the species. Most of the smaller species are producing between 100 and, and 1,000 eggs, but the larger species will produce about 2,500. She'll extrude those eggs into a ball in maybe three or four batches, depending on the species, and then she'll um, then go and fly back off over the, the river and drop those into the water um, in most species. Some species will actually walk down to the water's edge and then dip their, their um, abdomen into the water. Others will actually swim out onto the water and as they do so the, the eggs dissolve um, into the water. The, some of the species, the stoneflies are notoriously bad flyers and they don't, they don't like flying. And um, some of the species will actually climb as high as they can and just jump off, open their wings and sail down over towards the water and then drop their eggs as they're doing that drop their eggs as they're doing that. The eggs are, uh, are there's quite a lot of detail on the eggs, quite a lot of features on the eggs. <coughs> the, um, we've got quite a lot of structures and those structures are, are quite useful for identification. 
And then some of the more cryptic species, the only way that we can actually identify them is through the, the, the features, the sclerites and the, the different uh, structures on, on the eggs. Once the eggs have been laid, they, um, they need to incubate. And for each species, they have different incubation periods and optimum temperatures. This is actually the, probably the most critical stage in the um, bonefly life cycle. The, uh, the, the egg stage is when they can't move, they can't get to a, a different part of the, the river. Um, they can't move to um, cool or deeper water. Um, they're stuck in the bottom of the, of, of the river. So the, the, the temperatures are, are really quite critical at this stage. And this graph is a, a compilation of various studies that have been undertaken by Malcolm Elliott at the Freshwater Biological Association over the years. And it just shows you that the range in temperatures that, um, that uh, stonefly eggs can tolerate from Anthony Moore Stanfusi at the, at the top there with um, a very low temperature range um, up to Perla bipunctata and uh, Dinocrast cyclotes at the, at the bottom end there where they can to, uh, um, up to 25 degrees. Um, it, again, the, the um, eagle-eyed of you will have noticed that the top one there, Zucnia bifrons, doesn't have a, a median dot um, on it, um, showing the optimum temperature. And that's because um, Zwicknia bifrons is unusual in that it actually incubates its eggs within the, the female's body and she lays her egg, the, as she lays the eggs, they hatch immediately as they, they hit the water. So there's no incubation in the stream itself. But that, um, those, those temperatures on this graph are the, the temperatures that that species will actually um, survive at. Uh, as a surrogate for its incubation period. The nymphs are um, quite striking insects, and um, particularly the big ones, uh, like this dinocrats here. Um, they've got two tails, always got two tails, and they've got two long antennae. The legs are pretty um, robust um, for holding on in, in the uh, uh, fast water. They've got two large claws on the end of the, on the end of the tarsus as well. Um, this particular species is one of the Perlidae, and it's got external gills. You can just see underneath its, uh, uh, its legs there, it's got these little hairy armpits. Um, other species have gills underneath the, the pronotum, um, and also in this species, you can see it's got little uh, two pairs, a pair of anal gills as well. Um, the, most of these species are univoltine, so they, they've got one generation per year, but the larger species um, like Dinocrass and like Perla, uh, Perla bipunctata, can live uh, uh, need three and a half years to, to develop. So they're, they're a really good indicator of good water quality because they need good water quality, no pollution incidents or anything um, for that three and a half year period. They go through anything between 10 to 35 molts or instars um, during that time where they, they shed their skin, their, their larval skin, and then um, reharden it. And um, they all start off the life as herbivores, but the larger species in the Perlodidae um, and the Perlidae will become carnivorous partway through their growth. As they near maturity, their wing pads develop. And on this, this image here, you can just see the developing wing pads, these um, angular points at the end of the, on the thorax. And these will actually develop out a bit more and turn darker. And that's when you know that this is, a, this is ready to emerge. And when it is ready to emerge, it will crawl out at the shore on a stone or a, 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 a post or a bridge abutment or, or, or the like, and climb up and ready to emerge from the, the larval skin into the adult form. And these two images just show that process. And um, so the top image at the uh, top end image shows the, the adult crawling out from the larval skin and at, you can see that the wings are soft and not coloured yet, and the body is, is, is also um, a fairly pale colour. And over a period of um, an hour, maybe longer, um, it will start to harden up and you'll get to the, the stage at the bottom here. So again, this is Dinocrass um, cephalotes, so the same as the nymph that we saw in the last image. This is the adult of that species. You can see it's quite a flattened insect. Um, they're really good at crawling into little nooks and crannies. Um, and uh, I've, I've found, you know, taking field equipment out, um, in you know, leaving in the in on a piece of grass or something, and then 
going to use it again, you'll find a stone fly maybe up in amongst the in the mechanism of a sweet net or something like that. They're really good at hiding away. They like going into deep, uh, dark uh, nooks and crannies. Sometimes the only evidence you get of a hatch is when you find the exuvia on bankside stones and, and posts and the like. And these, uh, you find these um, in the morning after a hatch at night. Most of the species will, will uh, emerge at night under the cover of darkness, and you'll find these across stones. They're actually really useful um, to not only to know what's happening in the river, what species are in the river, but also to identify uh, to identify um, what's been hatching at that time. And you can see on this that you, you can still see all the features, such as the 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 tarsi, um, the coloration, tails, um, the the M line on the head, which is useful in in identification, um, and so on, and, and the big fully developed wing pads. Uh, and you can use this to identify the species. The, the key thing to remember though, and the thing that trips people up when they're doing this is that most people go straight to the adult key because it's out of the water, but actually this is a nymph you're looking at. This is the, the, the larval skin that you're looking at. So you need to use the, the key to larvae um, to identify it. Um, the adults are um, quite similar to the larvae, um, just with wings. Um, four wings and hind wings are of a similar size, as we'll see in a minute, and the wings are held flat or rolled around the body when at rest. Many species lose their tails on emergence, and that's a useful feature to uh, separate out the families. As I said, they are, they're, they're effectively just um, nymphs or wings, and this is Isoperla, a, a image, an illustration of Isoperla grammatica, and you can see there that the only real difference in those two images is the is the wings. There's various um, microscopic in, uh, differences in the mouth parts. Um, some of the species, um, the mouth parts are atrophied because they don't feed as adults, they just take up some water. Um, and others are, um, a, a bit, they'll feed on um, lichens and algaes and the like. They've got um, slightly modified mouth parts. One thing to note is um, that stoneflies are, are prone to brachypteri, so where the wings are shortened. Um, this is all the same species, this is an illustration from a textbook, um, and this is all the same species, but you can see that they all have different um, degrees of brachypteri. And the, the image on the, the specimen on the left is, is fully winged, and as we go through in the two in the middle are brachypterous, and then the one on the, the right is micropterous. Um, so it's got very short wings. Um, this is something that happens uh, in two main more main ways. Um, there's a there's either a sexual dimorphism in the wings, as in this case here, which is the uh, orange striped stonefly again that we saw. This endemic species we've got. And you can see on the the um, bottom image is a fully winged female. Um, on the top image is the male, which you can see has got these very short wings. So the wings are that short that this male can't fly. Um, it's restricted to running around on the on the gravels at the side of the, the river or climbing up the tree to follow the females. The females are pretty poor flyers and you, you tend to find the exuvia way up in the trees because they, they climb out as a nymph. Climb up, um, the highest I've seen is about 12 to 15 feet up a tree, what's that? Five meters, three meters, the maths. Um, up, up in a tree and, you know, they, they'll, they'll emerge up there and then just jump off to, uh, to lay their eggs, um, just gliding down to the river. And you can see the difference in the, this, the, this, this species here, the difference in the length of the wings. Another species with, that shows this is the common black stonefly, Zwicknia bifrons. This again is the female, which is fully winged. Um, and this is the male, and you know you would think there were no wings here at all, but you can just make out a little sliver of wing there. This one is, is virtually no wings um, and is restricted to just running around in the gravels at the sides of rivers and, and rocks, lakes. And the other way that uh, brachypteri can uh, can play a part is in altitudinal brachypteri. So in some species, as you go further and further up a hill, um, the wing length um, of the of the specimens is shorter, and this is a neat little study that uh, David Price did 
um, some time ago now in Scotland, looking at Luke Hippopis. Um, he had um, various Malays trapped around the country, looking at different um, altitudes um, and uh, at different altitudes and, and what the wing length was in species. And you can see that there is a, a very distinct um, reduction in wing length as you get to higher altitude. And we think the reason for this is because um, they're such poor flyers that if they were to um, emerge and fly off um, in these high altitude um, habitats, they just get blown away and they wouldn't get back to their, their, their mating um, streams that they want to um, lay their eggs in. So I think it's probably just a, a, a evolutionary um, uh, adaptation to living in those habitats. So you may wonder why do how how do they find each other if they're just running around in the in in the, the gravel? These males have to find the females, which are obviously you know able to disperse a bit more. And stoneflies have developed this uh, ingenious way of communicating with each other. So um, they can drum their abdomen to make a sound, which is then um, uh, responded to by the female. And each species has a different type of uh, signal. So what I'm going to do, hopefully this will work, I'll play some um, mayfly drumming for you. So this first one, the red um, items is the male drumming, and then the blue bits are the, the female replying. In this one here, it's the opposite, the blue bits of the male and then the red bits of the female. And this one down here is a uh, male. And what they're doing when they're doing this is that they're actually they're, they're on a bit of vegetation or a stick or a twig or something and they're vibrating their the end of their abdomen against that to make a, a sound and well it's actually the vibration that they're looking for we see this species here is this is Taneoptrix and you can see it just um, vibrating its abdomen there to make a sound and it'll repeat doing that until it gets a call from the female to, and then it'll triangulate and try and find where the female is and move in on it. And these these recordings are all done, um, the, you can record this quite simply by getting hold of a, a, a stonefly, stick it in just in a, a cardboard um, a box or tube and sticking it on top of a microphone. And I've used a, an iPad just with this on top and, and they will quite happily um, drum away. They'll only drum if they are unmated. Um, so if you if you really want to study drumming, you need to actually rear them from nymphs so you get unmated um, males and females together. Start again. Right. Moving on to identification. Um, so there are two main uh, publications at the moment for identifying adults of British stoneflies. Um, the first is the FBA key to stoneflies, and this was written by Noel Hines. It was actually based on uh, one of the very first keys of the FBA, um, which, uh, which Noel wrote in, uh, uh, in the 19, 1940s, 1950s. Um, the, it's, it's got it's, it's not got all the species because we've now got, um, we've obviously got Nemura lacustris in it. Um, there are, um, it is quite difficult in places and it does put some people off. Um, particularly some of the, the opening couplets uh, are about, go right into the detail and look at mouth parts and things, which uh, particularly in the, 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 that's in the nymphs. 
So um, David Price, Craig, uh, David Price, and Steve Brooks and myself um, did this FSC holdout guide that is a, basically an introduction to that. It, it it takes you past those difficult introductory points and just gets you down past the the family level. Um, it's still usable. You know, you, you, I still use the 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 key at the moment, but we are working on a new key to British and Irish stoneflies. Um, which is going to be a complete review of all the British and Irish stoneflies with uh, new keys to both adults and larvae. It's going to have both the line drawings um, that we expect to find in, in keys, but it's also going to have lots of photographic plates to show the features and some of the ecology of these, these species. There'll be full descriptions for each species, so a species account for each, uh, each one with identification notes, how to separate them from other species, the habitat and ecology, life cycles, food feeding habits, etc. And also lots of information about their adult and larval behavior. That hopefully, we've, we've, the text is written and we're getting, we've just about got all the images together. So hopefully that will be available um, in the start of the new year. Okay, so what features do we need um, to look at? for uh, identification? Well, first thing I'll cover is wings. And th these are, um, this is a typical um, stonefly wing. It's not got a great number of veins. Um, you know, it's not like a, a dragonfly, which has lots of cross veins or even a, a, a um, mayfly with lots of cross veins and, and long veins. But um, these are the main veins here. Um, and we're not gonna, I'm not going to go through this in any detail. What I want to show you with the pictures at the side is one of the main ways of separating out um, the chloroperlidae from the other uh, families is that you can see this this um, uh, on the Capnidae and, and other families that have this anal fan on the hind hind wing, so at the the very at the hind um, trailing edge of the uh, of the hind wings is this big fan shape. Which is what they use for, you know, their gliding when they're flying. In the chloroperlidae, it's really reduced. It's hardly there at all. Um, and that's that's quite a key point when you're separating out the families. You can also see some of the ve venation is important. So there's a ladder of veins here in the chloroperlidae forewing. Uh, in the capnidae, it's not the same. Um, but some of these cells are separating out species. Um, I'll point out a few other things as we go along. Um, the one in the Namura day, you, you're looking for this X shape in the, that's formed in the veins uh, in the, the sort of like towards the end of the, the wing. And I'll point that out when we get to some of the Namura day um, in real life. Tail length's also important. Um, so uh, you either have long tails uh, with many segments or you have very few, very short tails, maybe one or two segments at the most. And that helps you separate out the, uh, the Capnidae, Pallidae, Pallidae and Chloropallidae from the Lutridae, Neuridae and Caneoptera um, uh, And that's a very simple thing. And the, the tails on these, these insects tend not to get broken, uh, unlike um, meat pies and things like that. There's also uh, in the key, um, one of the, the important things is to look at the party and to look at the length of the segments. And there's basically three main groups. You've got the Caneoptera giddy, which all the segments are about the same length. They're all long. Um, in the Perlidae, Pelodidae and Chloropyrlidae, you've got two very short segments and the third segment is much longer than them combined. And then in the Capnidae, Lutridae and Nemuridae, um, the Segments one and three are about the same length, and the, the second segment is very short. In, the, in some of the Nemura, it almost looks like there is no second segment. There is, it's just underneath the, the, the first. Um, finally, uh, the terminalia, the, all, all the bits at the end of the body, um, these all have uh, names and are important in identifying the, the species. Um, I'll just quickly run through them here. We have in the top here, we have the males. Um, and we see that the main items that are important are the paraprops, which are the little plates um, at the side of the 
uh, in, in on the last segment, and that's Paracroc there and there. Um, the Cersei, so this is one of the species with a very short tail, and this has only got one segment. And depending on what species it is, it may have different uh, a different end to that segment. It might have a, a, a different shapes on the end of that, which are important. Um, there's the hyperprop, which is the plate underneath that comes out. Um, this is the ventral view here, and it comes up to uh, just below the just after the, the tenth segment. Um, and then the epiproct, and the epiproct is important. Uh, the shape of the epiproct is important in, in identifying some species. The um, in the female, it's all about the, the 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 plates on the on the abdomen on the ventral surface of the abdomen. Um, you've got a, often have a pregenital plate which is on the seventh segment. Um, we have a subgenital plate which is that covers over the the um, genital orifice. And then we've got a postgenital plate. Now, not not all species have a postgenital plate, but most have at least a, a pregenital plate and sometimes a subgenital plate. The one, the the main group, the the main family in the UK that has a postgenital plate is the Tineoptera giddy, um, which is really quite prominent. You can see in that um, image, that illustration there. Uh, they also have the paraprox, but they're less um, less uh, fussy. Uh, than the males, you know, the less less uh, structured, the more just a triangular plate. And the Cersei there, you can see again, um, they're fairly simple in that, that species. So in summary, um, to separate out the, the families, you can use the length of the tails and the tarsal segments to get you quite a long way in the identification and separate out the families. Um, so as you can see here, that's just a, a little summary that shows uh, what your, uh, how you would do that. Okay, so normally, if I was doing a workshop, I would like to do a, a field trip with it to take you out and show you some of these things in the field and show you where they live and what they do. Um, can't do that tonight, um, obviously, or can't do that just now because of the, the COVID restrictions. But I thought I would just go through some of the families show you some slides of where they are and what the features are uh, on them that makes you know that you can help identify them um it's not in the northwest area it's a bit further north it's, these are all images from cumbria and um, paul kennedy has been cataloging the the stoneflies of cumbria and has kindly um let me use his slides um for this and for the for the new key that's come in we'll start off the look today um look today are Fairly small insects. They um, have a really useful feature for, for separating from the other families, in that they roll their wings around their body. And the the only species that the only family that actually do this. Some of the Tineoptera gids um, will do it slightly, but they never fully um, cover the the body. Um, like you can see in this one here, where it, the wings right the way rolled down. This is Lutra geniculata. Um, it's um, relatively easy that is relatively easy to identify in it because if you look at the um, look at the antenna it's got these rounded segments and each of those segments has a whorl of hairs round about it you can see it quite clearly on that image even though it's slightly out of focus um, in other species in the look today the the um, internal segments are straight edged and parallel sided and they don't have that whorl of hairs. They might have little um, spiky hairs at the, the end of the segments, but never around the middle around the middle of them. And just an example there of the the, the, the genital plates, you've got the um, post the pre-genital plate and the subgenital plate there. It doesn't have a post-genital plate. And this is this so one of the other things to uh, I should have said earlier on was that when you're looking at the males, you tend to have to look at the dorsal surface of the abdomen, whereas in the females it's the ventral surface. And when you're using the key, um, the, the current key, uh, you've always got to remember which surface that you're looking at, um, because in many a time in a workshop where somebody's just got completely stuck, because they're looking at the wrong surface, and they're not picking up the features that we're meant to be looking at. Um, this is Lutra fusca. So Lutra fusca is probably one of the most uh, common Lutra and probably one of the most common um, stoneflies. It's an autumn species, so it 
uh, emerges any time from the end of July through to, it's still emerging now, we're still getting specimens just now. Um, you can see here the sort of habitat that it's in. So it's in, uh, it's in um, a range of habitats, actually. You know, this, this, is, this is quite big on its, uh, its scale. You'll find it in quite small habitats as well. You can see quite clearly the, the, cur the rolled wings around the body here and the shape of the, the subgenital plate. Um, one thing I didn't mention earlier on was that in the Leuchtidae, they have these processes on the on the dorsal surface of the of the abdomen, and the the position of these, which segment they're on, is important in the in their identification. Um, in some cases, you it, it's actually better if you turn it and look on the, with a lateral view because these things stick up and you can see them a lot clearer than uh, looking down straight down onto them. But depending on where they are and which way they're pointing, um, it helps you separate the species. Luke Triopophis, um, this a different type of habitat. Again, it's a smaller um, woodland stream, <clears throat> still with the stony bed. And you can see here, um, again, different shape of the, the subgenital plate and different shape of the, these processes. It's got these object processes here. You can also see there's a lot more going on um, with the genitalia as well. Luke Trianermis, um, Again, a, a, a very common species. This species is probably, you know, uh, matches Lutra fusca for being very common. Um, it tends to emerge earlier than um, Lutra fusca, so it's uh, in the late, late spring, early summer. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just the point again is this is a female and it's got the, the, the waved edge to its subgenital plate. So that's all like um, S shape there, um, which is key to this species. The reason that I'm highlighting that that uh, uh, part of the wing there, it will, will become apparent when I go on to the Nemuridae. And just to see that this has got a very simple double cross vein across here. Whereas in the, the Nemuridae, as we'll see, it's got a cross, uh, a cross shaped cross vein. Uh, just another picture of an Aramis, and you can see that this one doesn't have any of the raised, uh, this is a male, it doesn't have any of the raised processes, and that's the that's how you separate this from the other, other males of other species. And you've also, um, you can see the um, hyperplot there, um, in lateral view. So I mentioned the Nemuridae, um, and if you remember back to that Lutra and Aramis, it's got that straight cross vein across the, uh, the of the wing. You see here in the Nemuridae that the key feature for, for this family is the cross shape in the cross vein. So you've got this, this cross vein here and here and these ones here um, which create a cross in the, the wing and this is really um, evident. You can see it with the naked eye um, and all the Nemuridae have this to some extent. We have three genera in the uh, Nemuridae. I've only got pictures of two I think. Um, but I'll, I'll explain about the other one in a second. First is Protonomura, and this is Protonomura meri. Um, in the nymphs, they have uh, thoracic gills. They've got these gills underneath the, the prosternum. Um, and you can see here the, the remnants of them, the vestiges uh, on this adult. Um, so that's one of the features that you're looking at to separate, um, separate the Protonomura from the other Nemuridae. Um, the Amphinemura also have these gills, but they're in sort of like only in two bunches and they're, they're a bit more frazzled because of in the nymph, it's, it's, they're, they're more filamentous. Um, I don't have a picture of that. Protonemura um, meri is, is really quite common. Um, it's fairly widespread in, in the right habitat. Um, it's got these beautiful patterned wings, which you can see down here in the patterned legs. Um, very early season, it's, you know, you're, you're getting it in April. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so the, the two things we've got here, we've got the, the female with a, a large triangular um, genital plate and these um, shaped paraprops. And then the, the genitalia of the male are really quite complex um, and it takes a bit of a time to actually 
get your eye into what features you're looking at, um, but once you do, they're relatively straightforward to identify. Um, just there, again, just another image there to show you the, the wing and the patterning on the wing in that X shape. Moving in, oh, there's four genera, sorry. Um, Nemorella pictetii is, uh, is um, the only species in the in UK from Nemorella. Um, it's got uh, the, the, the partial segments are, are really quite similar in length. Um, the, they've got this, it's got this very long filament that comes out in the, in the male, um, which is really characteristic. And also in the female, it's got this really strange shaped um, subgenital plate with a, a large sort of like protuberance and then these two circular domed um, sclerites either side of that. Very distinctive species, both as, a, as an adult and as a nymph. Nemura cinerea is really common. It's found um, across most of the country in, um, um, I should have said Nemurella is, is typically found in marshy habitats and in, in slow flowing streams. Nemura cinerea is in um, ponds and ditches. You can find it in slow flowing rivers. You can find it in peat bogs. You know, it's found, it's really quite common across, uh, uh, across a wide variety of habitats. See here that the, the third segment of the, the tarsi is slightly shorter than the, the um, first in contrast to Nemorella, and the um, subgenital plate is rounded um, and broad. The male, um, the male is is easy to identify. You've got um, on the cerci these are. Uh, um, extensions, the, the, the remnants of the tail, there is a, a sort of act like head to it. Um, and once you see that, you know, it's, it can only be in the Mura scenario. It's also got a really grainy, dull um, pronotum, um, which is another feature that, you know, when you're looking at a specimen, it doesn't shine like the other um, species of Nemura. Nemura erratica, just to show you a contrast between that and, and Cineria, you can see that it's got very simple um, cerci. There's no, no um, pickaxe handles or points on them at all. Um, the uh, the subgenital plate is a bit more punky. It's a bit straighter rather than rounded. It's got these angular sides. Um, and the, uh, the paraprox are a different shape here as well have avicularis here and avicularis has got these these sort of clouded wings which is um, similar to Cotinamura but it never has the gills underneath the the prosternum and it's got these half moon shaped ends to the the cerci here and um, also in the the subgenital plate whilst it looks a bit like um, uh, Nemura erratica you can see underneath you can see these um, that's sorry, that's pregenital plate. You can actually see the subgenital plate underneath it. It's covered by it, and it's got these little rounded teeth there. Um, so that again, that's that's fairly fairly distinctive. It's also it's also a very distinctive insect um, compared to the other Nemura species because of those very good wings. Any up to um, They are uh, if you remember back to the the sort of like. Um, Crib sheet. They've got the segments of the party that are all say about the same length. Um, as you can see in this image here, this is Caneoptrix nebulosa britannica. Um, it this is one of the, the lowland um, sites that it's on. Uh, so it's a fairly slow flowing. It's not the the, the, the crashing uh, uh, upland stream that um, uh, we've seen in some other ones. Um, this is a species that is crawling around on the bank. Um, it's really quite common in, in weedy stretches. The, the key with this um, to identify is in the, in the larvae, there, they have this retractable gill at each of the, the cocks on the legs, so on the, uh, on the sort of the leg, if you like. And in the adults, you can still see the scar where that, that um, that gill was, you can see it there and you can actually just see it. It's like a little polo, I suppose, looks a bit like a polo 
on the on the underside of the leg. Um, the wing venation is important for separating it from the other genera. Um, so in this case, you can see here that the the, the vein CU one is branched only once. It's only got one branch. Whereas if I move on to Brachyptera, um, see again, it's slightly different, it, much more faster, more energy in the, this stream. Um, and the insect is, is sort of like a bit more patterned, the wings are more patterned. And in the wing, you can see that CU1 is actually split into two and sometimes into three um, sub veins. And the other thing, if I skip back, is that in, in Tineopteryx nebulosa, the, the, the post genital plate is pretty poorly developed. Whereas in um, Bacuta rizzi, it's really quite well developed into this pointed um, plate. And that's actually, you know, in some, in some specimens, you know, it's much, it can be much more common as well. The, um, there's two species in the UK, as I mentioned earlier on, and one of them is an endemic species. And the way to separate them, apart from the wing um, patterning, you can see that I mentioned that the, the wing tip is dark in, in Brachypter pisata, whereas in Rizzi it's, it's clear. The other thing to look at is the, um, is the antennae. And in Rizzi, the antennae are straight-sided like this, um, whereas in Pisata they're rounded and bead-like. The Capnidae, um, we saw this species earlier on. This is Swicknia bifrons. Um, these are tiny, they're, they're you know, five millimeters, um, really difficult to, to find if you go out and look for them, but they tend to turn up when you're not expecting them. Um, this is, I think, on the River Eden, and um, Paul found them along that fence line there, uh, just the adults on the fence. The, um, the, Again, it's all about the, the subgenital plate and the shape of that for separating these species. Um, wing length in the males is, is important. So Zwicknia bifrons is short-winged. Capnea atra and Capnea uh, vidua can both, are mainly long-winged, but can be short-winged at altitude. Um, the epiprot is important for identification. Also these little protuberances. In the Zwicknia, there's one protuberance. In Vidua, there's, there's two, and they're slightly further back, and the, the shape of the epiproct is, is different. The other feature that you can use to separate um, Capnia, sorry, Zwicknia bifrons is the shape of this cell that's marked with the X here. In Zwicknia, it's, um, it's got four sides to it, so it's quad quadrilateral, is that right? Um, in, in the other two species, in the Capnia species, it's triangular. Um, and that's particularly useful if you're using, if you're looking at um, museum specimens where the genitalia have all shriveled up, um, you can quite quickly pick out the, the Zwicknia specimen. Um, Chloroperlidae. Um, so this is a Cyconoperla terentium. There are, there are three species, and we've met Xanthoperla apicalis already. Siphonoperla terentium is probably the more common species of the other two. The other one is Chloroperla tripunctata. Um, it's, uh, they're all yellowish species, um, fairly small, um, no more than 10 millimetres. Um, as I mentioned, they've got this um, reduced anal area on the, the wing. Um, in in Siphonoperla, there's, uh, there's markings on the, on the pronotum, which are also quite distinctive. And the markings on the head are also used. Um, the subgenital plate is quite different to the other species we've seen so far. It's, it's quite extended, it's quite um, uh, detached, uh, if you like. Um, and also the epiproct is, is always present, always visible um, in, in uh, Siphonoperla and in Chloroperla. Um, and it's this hard chitinized um, process at the end of the abdomen. Perlidae. Um, so there's two Perlidae species in the UK. Um, the, they both live in big, fairly big rivers. Um, you do get them in smaller streams as well, always with quite a lot of um, zones, quite a lot of flow. You have um, Dinocross cephalotes, which is this species here, which is 
um, relatively large species. Um, it's got uh, the, the main feature is the, the head. Um, so this line here is called the M line because of the shape of it. And in Dinocrass, in front of that is dark. Um, so you can see there that the M line is light and um, in front of it is dark, whereas in Perla, it's, it's light. Um, and this is Perla here, you can see the difference. You can see the, the M line is dark and the front of the head is light. The um, various other features, you know, the wing variation is important. Um, the Perla is, is the largest stonefly in the UK. It's the, the females can be 30, 35 millimetres. Um, 35, 35 millimetres. Um, the, the males are shorter. Um, we've, we have done some work and shown that uh, th there seems to be quite a range in the size of these insects, and particularly between populations. Um, we're doing a little bit more work looking at how interrelated these populations are um, across both in Britain uh, and in Ireland. And just another image there um, from Shan Flint that shows the two species and how you can readily separate them um, with the Dinocrass on the left with the dark head and the Perla with the white head. For low today um, are the final um, groups, the final family to look at. Um, they all tend to have a light um, central line down the a pronotum sometimes on the head. Um, this is really quite obvious, particularly in the older specimens, and um, some of the new fresher specimens don't develop this until they've they've been around a bit. Um, and sometimes it's only when you put them into alcohol that they, that, that line comes out uh, it is obvious. The um, pregenital plate, subgenital plate, sorry, is um, very small in this particular species, Isopella grammatica. A really common species, it's found in most um, you know biggish rivers. Um, it has this distinctive ladder of, uh, this, this family's got a distinctive ladder of veins on the, the forewings. And as I mentioned earlier on, it's got these very short segments and then the long um, third segment. We've seen Perlodes mortini um, quite a bit, but this is the sort of habitat you get it in, sort of like small stony streams, sometimes up to quite high altitudes. Um, and um, yeah, we've seen this before. You can see that it, this one is, it's got the orange stripe and this one, the, the orange stripe is just developing here on this particular specimen. Um, it's a bit more obvious on these two. Diura bicordata is something that not many people come across. It's fairly widespread, um, but because it, it, it is a, it's a real high altitude specialist. So it lives up in the hills. It, um, likes this sort of habitat here. Uh, it's one of the species that, as I mentioned, it doesn't have, it tends to have short wings as a male, and the, the females can have short wings or, or long wings. Um, there seems to be two different um, races uh, of, of uh, two different forms, sorry, that uh, have different lengths of wings. Um, it doesn't tend to have the dark stripe on it until it, until it matures a bit. That was a quick field trip. Um, the, what I'd like to finish off with is uh, a little bit on collecting stoneflies. And um, this is this isn't stoneflies. This is just uh, this is a picture of uh, a mayfly hatch on the Mississippi River. But I just love this photo just to think that that this guy has had to stop and uh, is clearing mayflies off the road to get to his get his car across the bridge. Um, sadly, it's uh, a bigger problem now. I'd like to start with just reflecting, just to reflect on Kenneth Morton, who was a, a, a fantastic entomologist um, uh, in the middle of the 19th and uh, all through to the 20th century. He um, was born in Lanarkshire in Scotland, and he, he, he trained as a banker. He, was a, he was worked in the bank, um, and, but his passion was actually entomology, and he collected in various orders, including Neuroptera, Odonata, and Picoptera. And his collection is um, at the National Museums of Scotland, and it's got many types in it. Um, he he was he described 
quite a lot of species. Um, yeah, this is some of the slide collection here. It's got a massive slide collection at the National Museum of Scotland. Um, um, he did a lot of work on Brachyptera patata uh, that I mentioned before. And, you know, his collection of that is really important. This, these are all from the River Clyde, and it no longer occurs in the River Clyde. And it'd be great to think that we could uh, find it again, maybe one day in the River Clyde. He also did some really out there collecting. I mean, this is Loch Etkin, which is at 927 metres up in the Cairngorms. He visited this regularly to look at the stoneflies and, and the lochs around about it. This is the highest, one of the highest, um, uh, large water bodies in the in the UK. Uh, in the winter it's almost completely um, icebound, um, but Morton went up there to look for the stoneflies. Um, fantastic when you think about when he, what, what era he was doing this in. Um, and he described Capnea Aptra um, from here, from, from these, this type of habitat. He actually described, he, he found it at lower altitudes, but he still went up here to look for it. So all the usual techniques can be used for collecting stoneflies, um, you know, sweep netting, uh, beating bankside vegetation, you know, netting them as they're flying or they're crawling about on vegetation or, or light trapping. They do come to light and the Facebook group, um, Moth Trapping Tourist, regularly has stoneflies um, reported on there. Um, there's not a great number that come to light, but there's certainly um, several species that will, will be found on a light. The, but by far the most effective way of finding adult stoneflies is to look at fence posts in the spring, particularly in the spring. Um, the stoneflies will bask on these fence posts alongside rivers. Um, there's a great study that showed that, you know, even in a very cold day, say, you know, four mm. or five degrees air temperature, if the sunlight onto these um, these fence posts, it can reach 20, 25 degrees on the fence posts. So the stoneflies are there basking, they're um, getting the heat, getting the energy to to uh, go off and, and do their their thing. These are all males of the northern February red, that endemic species that I talked about earlier on, and they're actually feeding off the top of this fence post. So they're they're um, scraping off algae and lichen that are on the top of there. And bug life run every year, run a survey looking for stone for stoneflies in general, but um, particularly for the northern February red to try and get people to take photographs of of uh, stoneflies on fence posts, and um, we can identify them from that, or try to identify them, uh, try to identify them from that. And it's been quite successful in finding um, some new populations of northern February red, um, and confirming populations we already knew. Um, the preferred way of getting your records is through iRecord. Um, I regularly go on and verify the rec records on iRecord. Um, I verify both mayflies and stoneflies. And um, what iRecord is really good for is that there's some great recorders out there that are actually taking good photographs of the features that I need to verify uh, the, the specimens. And that means that there's actually, a, a, you can go on there and search for a species that you think you might have and see what images there are uh, associated with verified records. So for instance, this is a specimen that, um, this is a record that Sharon Flint sent into iRecord and she put in this image of Dynacrass cephalotes and I'm able to identify that and verify that. But more importantly, if you've got a specimen you think is Dynacrass cephalotes, you can compare it to uh, the images that Sharon has put up here of that species. Um, we're also quite active on social media. Um, there's a few people that tweet about stoneflies every so often. Uh, Hugh Feely over in Ireland um, uh, is regularly tweeting about stoneflies and other uh, insects. I'll do the same and so does Sharon Flint. Um, so it's always worth having a look in there, see what's happening. And sometimes, you know, we'll put, we'll put in things about how to identify a species or just something unusual that's happening or just that this is the time of year to, to see that species. Um, and that's that's all I want to go through to tonight. Um, but the recording schemes are there to receive your records and also to help you with ID. Um, the contact details are there um, for you. My Twitter handle is there. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for listening. 
Thank you very much, Craig. Um, if you could, uh, oh, maybe leave that uh, slide up for a few more seconds. Um, but that was a, that was a really excellent introduction, absolutely packed with information um, and fascinating too. I was I was really taken with the with the drumming there, and I think we've got a, a couple of questions on that to start. Um, we'll go into questions now. Um, and you can also, um, for, for everybody else, you can you can put your hand up virtually as as Leanna has demonstrated, and or you can just sort of wave it, wave your hand physically about as well, and we'll try and pick you up. But we're also going to just pick up questions from the chat and uh, and put them to Craig, uh, if that's okay with you, Craig. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Um, that's brilliant. Well, um, so the first question is from. Sophie Dorman saying, how loud is the drumming compared to say the sound of grasshoppers? So grasshoppers uh, tend to have a, a bit more directional sound. So that we're, we're um, they're, they're using the sound to, they're, they're listening for the sound if you like. Um, whereas in stoneflies, it's re really the vibration that they're using. Um, and they're looking for the vibration. So it's not that loud. You can hear it with the naked ear. Naked ear, is that a saying? You can hear it um, with your own, with your ear without any uh, uh, microphones or anything. But uh, if you really want to hear it, you want to, you want to record it um, to, to uh, hear it properly. And, and on the same theme from Kath, uh, my cat was very interested in the drumming. Is it possible there is a frequency we can't hear that the stoneflies can? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, um, uh, we'll need to do an experiment. <laughs> I suppose related to that, I, I had a question. I, I, I suppose with, if, they're, if they're doing drumming, then are they also releasing pheromones? So I don't know. Uh, I, I wondered about that myself and I've, I've not come across anything that says that they do, but and they don't they don't smell as as bad or as good or as whatever you your preference is as, as caddis flies. Um, you know, if you put them in a pot, you don't get a stinky pot. Um, so I tend to think that they probably don't release pheromones. Um, but I suppose that's still that's something perhaps that needs to be looked at as well. Okay, and then an, another question from from Kath in the chat: What what size are the adults? Obviously, that that's going to depend on the species. What do they range? They range from uh, about five millimeters up to about 30, 35 millimeters. Um, so the, the smallest ones are the Capnidae, um, and Zwicknia bifrons is a, probably about five six millimeters. Um, and then Perla, <clears throat> after the the female Perlas are. Uh, including the wings, are probably about 30 millimetres over that. Uh, and that's a really big insect, isn't it, really? Um, it is. It's one of the, it's yeah. one of the biggest insects um, uh, for by the dragonflies. OK, uh, oh, I'll, I'll take a, a question from, from Brian. If you, if, you, if, if you were trying to ask a question there, Brian, oh. or you were just waving um, your hand. Are they, are they best preserved dry or in alcohol? Um, probably best preserved in alcohol. Uh, if anybody has looked at the the pin collections from you know in any of the museums, they're they're pretty brittle. Um, the you you can rehydrate them, um, and certainly the wing venation is is fine. But if you're looking at the genitalia, you really want them to be a bit more supple. Okay, um, I'll take another question from the from a chat now, from Elaine. Is it possible to is it possible to identify many species in the field or from photos, or is it best to take a specimen? Uh, so there are there are certainly some species that you can identify um, from photos, uh, and in in the the new key, I hope to do a, a certainly a field guide to families. Um, so that you, a photo guide to families that you can use in the field. Um, it, it really depends. Um, so you can definitely do the big 
big two. You can do some of the smaller ones. Um, the, 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 there, is, there are probably um, four to a third of them that you could do in the field quite happily. You can certainly, I mean, when, when I'm doing the verification there on iRecord, there's probably about a third of them, you know, that you can happily verify from photographs, if you get the right photograph. And I, I suppose related to that, uh, from me just thinking, um, is so with the mayflies, they 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 have their wings raised. So does that make them easier to identify if you can get a really good macro of the of the genitalia, and, and whereas stoneflies are sort of covered up, aren't they? Yeah. Um. If you if you handle them carefully, um. Certainly the females, because the, you're looking for the, the ventral surface, you can you can actually hold them in your two fingers and take a photograph of of that surface. And one of one of the things that I'll do is I'll, I've got a little plastic um, hand lens and a blob of uh, uh, blue tack or other stuff uh, is available um, and stick that to my my phone cover and you can actually have that over and you get a 10 times uh, image you just stick it over your phone camera and you can get a 10 times image of that so that works quite well as well um, for the for the males, it's slightly more difficult. Um, sometimes you'll, in the lookers, you'll be able to see below the wings, uh, sort of like between the wings and the, the body to be able to see those little upstanding um, uh, processes. But for others, yeah, you really need to, you really need to have a specimen. Well, saying that in some of the males, you know, if they've got shortened wings, you'll be able to see the genitalia as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, another question from the chat from Ian Strachan this time. Will the new key include earlier nymphal stages? Uh, Ian Strachan. So, sorry. Um, sorry, Ian. <laughs> uh, can I just ask Ian, what, what do you mean by earlier nymphal st stages? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great, okay. Um, uh, well, I mean, I, like a lot of other people, do a um, uh, lot of surveys with kick sampling, and um, so it's um, very helpful. Well, I struggle with the, the FBA key sometimes with the with the some of the earlier stages um, uh, with, yeah. with quite a lot of the characters. I suspect that they're they're not they don't they're not consistent in the earlier stages. That's all. So, so what we what we've done is um, we've. Uh, done a key to the larval stages and where there are differences um, because of you know maturity of that larval stage we've highlighted that in the couplets and also in the in the um, species accounts we've added information about um, basically where you can get more information about those stages um, rather than reinvent the wheel if there's if there is a good uh, eyes of pearl is a good one where you know the the difference between Isoperla obscura and Isoperla grammatica um, get quite a few records of Isoperla obscura because the you've got a juvenile, uh, a very a very small specimen. It just looks like Isoperla obscura, um, and we've we've made that fairly explicit in the in the species account where where how you separate from different. Great, great, thanks. Craig, I think I, I missed so you, um, when you were you expect that to be released next year. I, I think you said, yeah, <laughs> yes, it'll be. Uh, uh, we've got all the text together. Uh, I think I'm talking speaking next week with the publishers. So um, we've we've still pulling together some of the images, um, but I would hope that it'll be early in the new in the new year. Yeah. And that will be that's FSC or FBA or it's an FBA key, um, okay. and uh, the plan is for FSC to be the publisher. So we're working with FSC to to um, design it and because they know how to do it. Excellent. Um, okay, um, a question from Pigeon. Um, do they have anything on their abdomen that helps them make the drumming sound? Mm. Yeah, so some of the some of the species have a, a small hardened sort of like knob that they they use to um, like a plate that they use to uh, to drum with. Um, so Tinny Optrix is one of those. It's got a little sort of like drumming lobe, 
um, which it uses. Um, other, most of them, it's uh, most of them are using the whole abdomen. Um, some of them will just use that little lobe. Okay, a question from Helen James. Regarding the slide showing wing length versus altitude, why would altitude drive brachyoptery? Is it because the wind velocity rather than the altitude per se? Probably yes. Yeah, I think it. Uh, yeah, almost certainly it's it's because the the if they get off the ground at all, they're going to get blown away. Um, and the wind velocity is higher at uh, higher altitude certainly in Scotland, where the study was done. Okay, was there any any follow up to that, Helen? Is that okay? That's fine. Thanks very much. All, all good. Thank you. Okay, uh, a question from Andy Musgrove. When counting sternites, can you assume that number one is the basal visible one? And is it that simple? Or are there sometimes, or are they sometimes hidden? So the first one is often very slim. It's 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 hidden underneath the uh, wing pads. And um, the best thing to do is if you count down and you only get nine, then you've missed one. Um, so I I tend to count back the way first and then work out where I've got to start. Okay. Great. Um, okay, now from John Maxson. Why should some species have up to 34 molts? Seems excessive. Is the growth rate very rapid? Um, so some, well, uh, we think some, some mayflies have over 50 molts. Um, so uh, it's not particularly excessive in, in freshwater invertebrates. Um, the, the growth rate in most of the species, I, I suppose, I'd have to think which, which species has the most molds. Um, there, there are some species where very long life cycles, you know, so you've got three and a half years, which would suggest they would have more molds. I'm trying to think off the top of my head which ones have the longest, the, num the biggest number of molds. Um, and whether there are some with fairly rapid um, growth because they they tend to be they tend to um, stay in the egg stage for uh, a lot longer um, across the summer because that's a that, that's a period when they um, the, the nymphs aren't going to survive as well and they emerge out of the the gravels as small nymphs in um, the autumn so right about now you would still well, maybe October you would have started seeing small nymphs. Um, coming out of the gravel, particularly in the Pelodidae. And if you think about Pelodidae's mortini, which is, uh, you know, it's maybe about 20 millimetres long, um, it's only hatching in October and it's emerging in March. So it has got to get through quite a bit of a, a, a development to get to the stage of actually being able to emerge. Interesting that there does seem to be some, sorry, some of the work we've done shows that if you get towards the end of that development period as a nymph, you, if you get a, a really weird set of weather conditions where you get um, perhaps a very warm spell, then a very cold spell, it, you, you end up with a lot of deformities in the adults, in the wings, and it looks like that last instar is really critical. And I, I do wonder whether with climate change, whether we're going to start, a, you know, climate um, changes and warming, whether we're going to start to see more of that deformity. Thank you. Um, actually, well, I, I was thinking about of asking a question on climate change, just on because they're you know they're a temperate group. Are they retreating? Some of the species. Um, we think in the UK we think that Capnia vidua and Potanamura montana are in trouble. Um, Diura bicordata seems to be quite widespread, but um, is quite uh, is already at a high altitude. Cotonomura montana is a high altitude species as well because of the, the the need for cold water, and we're just not finding it that much. Capnia vidua is the same. You can find some some uh, rivers where it's quite common, but others where it's just disappeared. Uh, and I 
think that, you know, I think there's more to be done on looking at stoneflies and the impacts of climate change. Thank you. Okay, a question from Richard Dawson. Do the females have time panel organs? I think that means hearing organs, isn't it? Mm -hmm. to, to hear the drumming through the air or is it via the vibration of the substrate? I'm not 100% sure, Richard, but I think it is the uh, vibration of the substrate. Um, certainly when you look at them on, uh, if you've got them in the lab and you're doing it and you've got one over here and one over there on, on separate tables or whatever, they're not, they're not responding to each other. It's, but when you put them close to each other and you say have the two boxes touching and they're, vib you know, they're, they're, they're getting vibration through it, they, they will respond to each other. So I don't. It, I certainly don't think it is. Um, it is. It, it's audible sound that they're looking for. It's the vibration. Okay. Uh, a question from Naomi Lumsden. Do you often find or look for stonefly eggs in the field, and are they easily recognisable compared to other aquatic insect eggs? Wow. Um, I only ever look for them when they're attached to a stonefly, if that makes sense. <laughs> when you see the little egg ball, um, when they get into the river, you rarely see them. What you do find though is, um, so as with most aquatic insects, uh, they, they find water by uh, the reflection off of the surface, the horizontally polarized, polarized light that's reflected off the surface of the water. And other surfaces reflect that light. So things like wet roads, um, some glass surfaces, particularly red and black cars. Don't ask me why the colours, it's something to do with physics and that, yeah, that's beyond me. But, um, and if you, if you have a, if you go to a car park that's next to a river that has, you know, hat stoneflies or mayflies for that fact, you'll actually see them laying their eggs on top of the cars. Um, and stonefly eggs are, are really difficult to get off because they've got this sort of like, um, secretion this this jelly like structure to them that when they get wet they they bind to the the bed of the river um when they bind to your car you really got to scrape them off um but i have seen i have seen uh lucha particulata laying eggs on on car roofs wow okay uh, another question from ian uh, how does our fauna compare with the rest of Europe? Oh, pretty rubbish as usual. Um, we've, we've only got 35 species. There's, um, gosh, how many are there in, in Europe? There's probably about 300, maybe more. Um, particularly, particularly if you count Scandinavia as part of Europe, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch up in the, the north of Europe. Um, it's, uh, uh, there's important populations in the Alps. Um, as well, the Tatra Mountains. Um, yeah, there's, there's some really important species. There's a lot more endemics in Europe. Um, we're, we're, quite, we're, we're quite rich in endemics, if you think about it, for a small order of two, two species and two subspecies, but there's a whole bunch more in, in Europe. Uh, Ian, is, is that what you meant with your, with your question in terms of the co yeah. a comparison with species numbers? Yeah, it's great. I've seen the thumbs yeah, that's off. Fine. That's, that's good. Thank you. Um, okay, a, a question from, from Keith Elder. Once stoneflies are lost from rivers, is it difficult for them to recolonize because they are poor flyers? Um, depends how they've been lost. Um, so in, in all river systems, in, in aquatic invertebrates, you know, th there's a there's a continual drift of invertebrates downstream. Um, so if, if you look at if you look at adult um, aquatic insects, they tend to fly upstream, and that's because they're compensating for that drift downstream. Um, so that drift can happen uh, in tributaries and in the main stem and, and wherever. So over time, you can get recolonization from other parts of the river system or the other the catchment. Um, if they are lost. You know, wholesale from a river, then yes, it's probably very unlikely that they're going to recolonize. Um, there are some that fly a bit better. I mean, I I had a, a big uh, perla uh, female fly through my garden um, during lockdown. Um, you know, I, 
and they go and this thing flies past me. I'm thinking, I can't do the river, but you've come to me. Um, but I'm nowhere near a, a river that would hold that species. All that I've got lots of ditches around about here, but the the, the river is probably about a kilometer, about three kilometers, four kilometers away from me. So that species has either pitched a ride in a car and then flown off and found my garden, or it's it's flown that distance. They do some of the Namuras um, will get caught up in the wind and get blown as well. So there is there is a bit of that. Um, uh, accidental recolonization, colonization, I suppose, potential there, but um, not nothing that I would think would, uh, uh, you know, that would help it in, in any time. Yeah, when I think about moth trapping and I'm away from a river, I just, I just don't get stoneflies, yeah. but I would get, I'll get caddis. Yeah, yeah, caddis, caddis definitely disperse a lot more, um, mayflies, and snowfly is not as not as good. Okay. Um, oh, Kath um, is asking about drumming um, again. So, oh, meant something. So, as we move away from drumming, so I meant the frequency of the of the vibration through a substrate. Yeah. So um, the frequency. So e each species has a different um, drumming signal. And uh, there's there's different ways of analysing that, and part of that is the frequency of the drumming, um, and you can describe that um, that drumming signal on the basis of the the frequency and the the duration of the of the drumming. And in fact, quickly a bifront that we saw there is actually a, you know, there's a complex of species associated with that that species. And uh, Louis Boomans in um, Oslo. Uh, actually worked on that and actually did the, the drumming to identify which species was which. Um, so it was, it, you can use the drumming to actually separate out the species. Um, oh, okay, a question from Rod Hill. Are the frequencies of vibration drumming a consequence of the physical technique um, or is oh, there any okay. information question contained within Rod these Hill. frequency ranges? Are the frequencies um, of vibration drumming a consequence of the physical technique? I'm not sure. Or is there any information contained within information these frequency ranges? In the, within the frequencies. I suppose the actual um, the technique defines the information. Yeah, doesn't I'm it? not yeah. sure yeah. what Rod means by information. Um, did you did you want to within the frequencies? Follow up on that. Rod. I suppose the actual the technique defines the information, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, did, you, did you want to yeah. Yeah. follow um, up on that, Rod? If you just tap on something, it can produce a frequency and it's going to peak and tell uh, according to the method yeah. that you use yeah. to tap. Um, so if you are, just, are just tap on something, can see it can produce a frequency to and it's going to arrange a frequency peak and tell according to them, the method that you use. Mate. To tap, or is there additional so information just tapping over and above in sequence that that is intentional? A range of frequencies that mm, identify really them to their mate, um, or is there additional I don't, I don't information the I, over I, and I above? Hadn't actually thought that, of that. That is intentional. No, but I will look mm, into that's that. That's a really good question. I don't know. Right. Um, I don't. Yeah. I don't know the answer okay. to that. I, I, I see. I, what you, I see what you're getting at, and I, I actually can't. thought of that. I mean the. The technique no, must be the same for them to get the same result every right. time. But yeah. is there anything else okay. that they're? I, I see what you're, I see what you're getting at, and I can. With that, yeah. I mean, the, like a bit the like technique must code. be the same for them to get the same yes, result every time. Tap. Indefinitely, to let someone know you're there. But is there or anything you can else tap that they're? Specific way to anything else that give is communicated with that? Yeah. Well, the it, message it, is. It, it, like, a bit like Where are you? I want to meet with you, I suppose. But <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Definitely, to let someone know you're there, or you can tap in a specific okay, way. Okay, Craig. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if any, if, uh, I think there the are, message there is, are, there are, the female Where are you? I want to meet with you, I suppose. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you, do, you do tend to get... Um, Okay, Craig. I wonder, I, I wonder, I wonder if any. If, I think there are, there are, the there are. Will, the female will so do a reply and, and a response. Then, you know, there'll be a so you, when they you get do, to you the do tend to get. It, you know, she'll um, give a different response. This is right. I'm ready you to do meet. Tend to get different yeah, signals from the female, where the female will kind of parrot so them here, and 
Then, um, so there is there is a different when they get in the actual sense, side but, that uh, she'll give a different spot if there's anything I'm ready to else. Make within yeah, there as well um, hopefully um, not, um i've got jennifer dodd who's he's given a but, um, hypothesis so there is, there is a different in that might there sense, be a subtle but, association uh, with the size of individual making the drumming within a bigger well. individual more noise better um, choice I've got jennifer dodd who's he's given a well jennifer, hypothesis I hope that's one of your students will be able to tell us might that. there be a subtle association with the size of individual making the drumming that's a cop -out. i'm sorry a I, bigger I don't individual, know more um, noise better choice i, I well, Jennifer, I hope that's one of your students will be able to tell I us don't that. Know. <laughs> it depends if it's noise, if it's That's vibration. a cop-out, I'm sorry. You know, I, I don't noise, know. Noise um, I, the vibration I, could be the same, but the noise could be different. I don't... Nah, I don't know. That's really stretching my... It depends if it's noise, if it's vibration. You know, uh, noise, noise um, suggests... Oh, then, then I added a the quick question, Craig. Same, um, the, the you, there was an, one of the species you mentioned right at the beginning, which that's really stretching thought to have gone extinct. Physics, so. mm -hmm. I thought, well, that looks distinctive. Um, oh, then, then, then I had a, sort of a quick question, the, Craig. Um, last or you, last was one of the species you mentioned right I at the beginning, which you look really <laughs> thought to have gone extinct. Quite like that, maybe mm. sci-fi. I not, thought, well, that so looks distinctive. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and then you yeah. sort of got to the is, is that? Last but, so how can I tell that, that extinct I one when I see it next week? Really <laughs> OK, so you're right. Siphon of Perla and Flora of are both from the same family as Santa Perla. Is that? So how can I tell that? Way to tell them extinct apart one when I see it next week. Uh, okay, so um, the so you're Western right. Siphon of Perla and Flora of Perla are both from the same family as Santa Perla. Um, the the way to tell them apart is that the head and the the pronotum the are, are description of the yellow. Is These are tiny, are so no they're about 10 millimetres. Um, but the key thing right for me, the, the most striking thing for me um, about the, the two-toed head and the, the, the pronotum the, are, are the basal segments yellow. are yellow. These are the tiny, the so they're about 10 millimetres. Um, but the key dark, thing for me, the most striking thing for me about it is the two-tone. And I'd love to see it again. But it'd be great. The basal segments are yellow, but from, the uh, apical segments from France segments are, um, but yeah, are, it'd be great dark, to see them really black. I still think that um, there may, that's there may be some tell it lurking in museums. I'd love to see it again. I think it'd be great. Uh, as well. It used to be specimens um, from, uh, it was from France. It was, uh, it was um, but yeah, it'd be great to see them. I still think there was, there may be some lurking in museum as well. Um, so uh, as yeah. well, it used to be. If you are, yeah, if you do have a museum, museum collection, collection you've got access yeah. to museum um, collection. Um, have a Palida. Have a it it search was, through for um, Santa Perla. Recorded as at one point as well. Recorded as Isaac, um, so, yeah. Hamulak. If you are, well. if you do have a museum There's collection, a few you've got access you know, to museum collection. Synonyms. Um, um, have a have a search through for Santa Perla. In fact, it was recorded as yeah, well, I'm sure. I'm sure if it was in Hamulak World Hamulak Museum, me and Wallace would have. Uh, with a few different <laughs> you know, synonyms. Yeah. Um, I did uh, find uh, specimens of um, eyes of pearl or obscura in Dublin. Yeah, well, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure if it was in World train, Museum, so me and Wallace would have. Uh, out of, uh, <laughs> specimens as well. In fact, it wasn't. It was I. Yeah. Is it Isogenus did find specimens of um, one of the species Isa Perla obscura in Dublin, in Dublin um, which was um, from, the, from the trench. So there was there was a bit of sharing out of uh, specimens as well. In fact, it wasn't. It was I. It was Isogenus nubecula. I think there was there was one of the species I found in Dublin, um, which was a bit of a turn up for the books. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Thank you, everyone. And um, as as uh, as I said, we'll we'll send you a link to the recording so you can go over those identification tips all over again when you when you have specimens in front of you um right thank you very much and and good night